Hello, this is Haku the Bean, and today we are going to be reading a creepy pasta story called My Town Was Invaded by Monsters from Another Dimension. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. Third time's the charm, right? For the first time in a week, I am able to send out a message to the world, telling all who will listen about, about the plight of my people. Seven days for an entire town to be laid to waste and for most of its population to be slaughtered by enemies we never knew existed. All that while our own military has stood by and watched. No, it's worse than that. The army haven't just ignored our plight, they've deliberately cut us off and left us to die. In fact, they've even gunned down innocent civilians who have attempted to break through their barricades. This is how far they're willing to go to cover up the incident, but we've managed to slip through the government's net, and now I'm going to reveal the terrible truth to you all. My name is Dante, and I am a 40-year-old divorced father of one hailing from a town called Purgatory. A small and unremarkable settlement, which you've likely never heard of. I have an 8-year-old son who lives with his mother, and, is, and thankfully is far away from this living hell. I just hope I'll live long enough to see him again. Amongst our small group of survivors is my sister Lily and her six-year-old daughter Eve. We fought tooth and nail to save Eve and the other children in our party, and I'm not going to give up on them now. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This nightmare all started in the early hours of last Sunday morning. I was at home in bed when I suddenly got woken up by a heavy... It sound outside of my suburb and home. Dragging myself up, I groggily moved over to the window and pulled back the curtains. I recognized the sound of swirling rudder blades, and looking up into the dark, I sky to see a group of three helicopters flying in tight formation and illuminated by their searchlights. I watched as the trio of copters flew over our sleepy town and headed west towards the snow-peaked mountains on the horizon. These pauses like to make sure I'm still recording. I was puzzled by the sudden appearance of these aircraft, but not overly surprised. Hikers and climbers would frequently traverse the mountains, and sometimes they would get into trouble up there. Back in the day, there was a substantial coal mining operation in this area. The mines were closed now, but there were a lot of discarded shafts, which could be treacherous if one didn't know the lay of the land. Therefore, I got off the helicopters as being part of a rescue mission and went back to bed. Little did I know that I just witnessed the start of an event which would change my world forever. I woke at the normal time and initially had no indication that this would be anything other than a normal Sunday. My first clue that something wasn't right came when I lifted up my phone to go through the normal routine of checking my emails and social media feeds. However, I was unable to connect to the internet or even receive a, a phone signal. This was irritating and rather unusual, but not unheard of. We lived in an isolated rural area close to the mountains, and so cell, cell coverage was often patchy. I made no connection between the loss of phone and internet service and the helicopter flight I observed the night before. And so I went about my day as normal, washing, dressing, and preparing my morning coffee. In fact, I was sitting from a hot cup of joe when I made my way over to the front window to look out into the street. And then I witnessed something extraordinary, which I could not explain. And so he goes on to explain it. I heard the intro level before I saw it, noting a heavy thumping on the asphalt that shook the whole street. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I watched in awe, hardly believing what I was seeing. The beast which stomped along the tarmac was unlike any art animal I have ever seen before. And certainly wasn't indigenous to these parts. The best way I can describe it would be a cross between a rhinoceros and a Komodo dragon. A huge head, I mean a huge animal with a horned head, tough gray scales, short stubby legs, and a long swinging tail. Its yellow eyes moved back and forth in agitation like it was as surprised to be here as I was to see it. I didn't know how to react or what to do, and so I merely stood at the window, 
frozen in awe and fear as I watched the impossible creature stomp its way along my previously quiet suburban street. I realized I was witnessing a bizarre and dangerous situation evolve, but soon it reached the breaking point. I heard the familiar sound of a car engine and looked to the far end of the street in time to see Mr. Taylor's pick of truck around the a corner. Mr. Taylor was my neighbor, and I knew he was returning from his night shift, just like he did at this time every morning. I'm guessing he was tired. After working hard all night, and was looking forward to getting home to bed. The last thing he would have expected was to find his path blocked by an otherworldly beast which had inexplicably invaded his home street. He slammed on the brakes when he saw the animal, but it was already too late. The horde monster was spooked by the vehicle and responded with aggression. Charging along the tarmac with a mighty force, the ground shaking as it moved. Mrs. Taylor saw the attack coming and tried to put his truck in reverse. But the beast hit him head on, using its horn to lift his vehicle off the road and turn it over. Not yet satisfied, the monster trampled on top of the overturned truck, crushing the vehicle under its immense weight and strength. I was powerless to intervene merely watching as the savage animal crushed Mr. Taylor's vehicle underfoot before finally it moved on and left our street behind. <sighs> Only did that I run to my front door, sprinting out onto the street, quickly making my, my way over to the wreck. I cried out my neighbor's name and lay down upon the, the tarmac, only to see Mr. Taylor's body crushed beyond recognition, a bloody mess of broken bones and viscera. Sadly, my neighbor was beyond help, and there was nothing I could do for him now. My mind was racing as I tried to control my breathing and avoid succumbing to blind panic. All I could think of it in that moment was getting to my sister and niece to make sure they were safe. I didn't like my chances of going to my car in case I ran into that monster, and so I decided to proceed on foot. But there was one item I reckoned I would need. Therefore, I darted back into my house and went straight to my a gun cabinet. Unlocking it and arming myself with my hunting rifle, I was filling my pockets with spare ammunition. Once I ran back onto the street, I heard a cacophony of sounds, interrupting what should have been a quiet and peaceful morning. I heard a, ding a sound of distant sirens and screams of a terrified citizens, and the ominous roars of unidentified creatures. A chill ran through me as I realized the death of Mr. Taylor had been an isolated incident, and it seemed like most of the town was now under attack. I didn't have time to think about this, however, as instead I spent a couple of blocks to my sister's home street. I was relieved to discover that Lily his flock seemed untouched by the chaos occurring around us. Although there was no way of knowing how long this would last, I ignored the manic barking of the neighbor's German Shepherd as I banged my fist against my sister's front door. What the hell, Dante? she exclaimed as she opened the door to let me inside. Don't you know what's going on out there? I asked frantically. No, she replied as her eyes widened in near panic. I saw what says on the TV. I tried calling you, but the phones are down. I looked at the television set, hearing a buzzing static attic and seeing a transmitted message which read, This is the emergency broadcast system. Please stay inside your homes and wait eight further instructions. Without thinking, I grabbed hold of the remote and started flicking between the channels, only to find the same emergency message on every station. Jesus, I swore in disbelief. Wherever the hell was going on, it was escalating quickly. I continued to say at the TV in disbelief until I heard a soft whimpering from behind me. Mommy? Uncle Dante? What's going on? I turned around to see my niece Eve, still dressed in her pajamas and clutching hold of her favorite teddy bear. She didn't understand what was happening, but I could tell she was scared. I stood there looking into my niece's eyes and not knowing what to say, but luckily her mother took charge, going to her daughter's side and embracing her in a tight hug. It's okay, sweetie. There's no reason to be frightened. 
Your uncle and I, and I are going to handle this. Just go back to your room and play your video games. Eve looked up suspiciously to her mother and then at me. She's a clever young girl, and I think she knew we weren't telling her the whole truth. Nevertheless, Venice obedient went up the stairs and returned to her bedroom, leaving Lily and I to talk frankly. What do you know? She asked abruptly. This and, and, and surprised me. My sister had always been an practical woman and never avoided getting to the point. Not much, I replied honestly. But I saw one of my neighbors killed by some kind of animal. What, like a bear or mountain lion? Lily asked. No, I replied ominously. It wasn't like any animal I've ever seen before. Like something from a nightmare. My sister stared at me in bafflement, and I think she thought I'd lost my mind. She was about to ask a follow-up question when we were suddenly distracted by records occurring on the street. Stay here, I ordered, as I lifted my rifle and head for the door. I should have done better, however. As Lily followed me back outside with a silly determined in her brown eyes. We heard these the sound of her neighbor's dog barking as it ripped up into a frenzy, and we soon discovered why. A flock of half a dozen winged, winged predators descended from the blue skies, screeching as they dove down towards the guard dog with claws and beaks extended. Again, I couldn't identify the winged beasts, but would describe them as something similar to giant bats, each with a wingspan of close to six feet. So, you're getting attacked by dinosaurs? Okay, then. <sighs> the dog jumped up with his jaws open and fangs exposed as he went to battle with the lead bat. Bang deep into its throat, the winged creature screamed in pain as blood poured from a gaping wound in its throat. The guard dog had been the first attacker, but the poor mutt was heavily outnumbered. The remaining five bats tore into the dog, slashing and biting into his flesh in a sickening feeding frenzy. In that moment, the dog's owner charged out of his home, shotgun in hand. He roared in fury, cocking his gun as he screamed, Get off my dog, you bastards! <laughs> that is such a hillbilly accent. I had to, though. He fired, hitting the bat like creatures with buckshot. Suddenly, I remembered the hunting rifle I carried on my shoulder. Aiming and, fire aiming and firing, and hitting one of the hellish, hellish bats in its torso. Chaos ensued as wooden bats flew, fell from the sky, and the survivors fled in a blind panic. I ran forward, meeting my sister's neighbor on the dead ground as he scrambled to help his wooden dog. But when I looked down at the poor animal, I saw it had been mauled badly and had lost a lot of blood. Instinctively, I knew that the dog wasn't going to survive. I guess his owner knew so too. Because he gratefully cradled the dying animal in his arms and cried in, in grief. My boy! Look what I've done to my beautiful boy! It was a tragic event to witness, but sadly, there will be many more tragedies to come over the next few days and nights. We didn't know it back then, but this was the first wave of the inexplicable invasion, which would hit purgatory and reduce our town to a living hell in one short week. We called wave one the beasts, for they were simply animals, dangerous but not organized or coordinated. 
They inflicted damage and caused a mass panic, but were nothing compared to those who followed them. Like I said, we knew next to nothing at this stage. We also took the government's advice and returned inside Lily's his home, trying to comfort the crying Eve as chaos continued on the streets. My sister Avery was called Dan. We, we invited him to join us, but he declined. Louis told me how Dan was a recluse who lived alone. His dog Rex had been his sole companion, so the loss of his beloved ha pet hit him hard. It was late in the afternoon before the sounds of battle began to subside. Soon after dusk, we saw a patrol car pulling up on the street, and W.E. jumped out and approached Lily's front door. I peeked out the window and was relieved to see E. a friendly face. W.E.'s name was Carl, and he had an old friend who had known since middle school. And he was an old friend who had known since middle school, sorry. I opened the door and greeted him, knowing how his face was drawn and his eyes bloodshot. I guess that he's had a long shift. William invited the cop inside and went to make him a cup of coffee while we talked. What the hell is going on out there? I asked incredulously, hoping that I would finally receive some answers. Unfortunately, I was to be disappointed. Carl shrugged his shoulders before he answered. Damn if I know. It was supposed to be my day off, and then I got a call from the sheriff saying all hell's broken loose. We got on the streets and saw all these damn monsters causing mayhem. I've never seen anything like it, man. It's taken us all day to get on top of it. We shot the big one undead on Main Street. The sheriff had to empty a whole clip into its head before it went down. I've lost, lost count of how many e e cri easy critters we've had to shoot. Where did they come from? I asked. From the mountains, we think. There's been sightings of them I'm coming down since dawn. Whew. Come on, Carl, I interjected. I've lived here my whole life. So have you. There's nothing like those monsters living in the mountains. Carl raised his hands defensively, saying, Hey, man, I want to report what I've been told. What about the emergency broadcast, I inquired next, and the phones and internet, what are the authorities doing? I swore I could see Carl's face turn paler before he answered. That's what really scares me, buddy. Communications are completely down. We can't reach the feds, the state police, not even the town next over. And that's not all. They blocked the roads, the bridge, and the mountain path. What? I exclaimed in shock. Who's blocked them? Who do you think? The military, by the look of things, Carl confirmed. They've got a lot of scary firepower and are ordering drivers to turn around and go home. The sheriff's tried to speak with their commander, but he's not returning our calls. My heart sank as I considered the terrifying implications of what my friend was telling me. I've already told you that our town is out of the way, but perhaps I didn't, I didn't emphasize this point strongly enough. No. 
Purgatory is situated in a valley with mountains on one side and a wide river on the other. There are only two ways in or and out. A road cutting through the mountains and a bridge over the river. And now both but now both were sealed off. So we're trapped like rats? Larry cut off from the world and left to the mercy of monsters from God knows where? I responded to my sister's voice, looking back to see her standing in the doorway. Clearly, she'd been listening in on our conversation, and as always, we had summarized, summarized the bleak situation pretty damn well. An ominous silence fell over the grimace, none of us could think uh, to say in next. But eventually, the silence was broken by a burst of static from Carl's radio, as emergency a call came in from the sheriff's office. Duty calls, Carl said. Press relief to have an excuse to exit this Sorry. difficult conversation. Stay safe, you guys. Whatever this is, I'm sure it will be over by tomorrow. But of course, he was wrong. Also, I love how I just changed his accent like three times. We all slept in the front room that night. Lily held it even in her arms while I cradled my rifle and kept a watchful eye on the door. In truth, I barely slept a wink. And even when I did drift off, I was plagued by monsters of terrifying beasts and savage monsters. My nightmares of terrifying beasts and savage monsters stuck in the streets of our once peaceful town. Nevertheless, we survived uh, to see the next morning. The first wave of the invasion had come and gone. No doubt there were still dangerous beasts while well, I accidentally kind of forgot to speak there, sorry. Of an unknown origin roaming through the mountains and woods. Now I have to check again. But the town itself was relatively secure. Or so we thought. We didn't know it yet, but the second wave of the otherworldly invasion was about to begin. I awoke to a loud banging on the front door, jumping up from the couch and grabbing my rifle. Lily was up too, her eyes widening at the whispered, What the hell now? Oh, as she whispered, sorry. Am I even Carl, or one of the neighbors at the door? But my instincts told me otherwise. Eve was awake too, of course, the worry be evident on her baby face. Go to your room, her mother ordered, but my niece refused to leave. I went over to the window and peeked out at the figure at the far side I had, recoiling in shocked horror at what I saw. The creature knocking on my sister's door took the appearance of a man, but almost certainly wasn't human. He wore an ill-fitting black suit and tie which gave him the appearance of a salesman or a missionary, but his face was an unnatural, ghostly shade of pale. Meanwhile, his head was totally bald, and he had no eyebrows or facial hair. And what's more, his eyes were too large for this head, appearing as a pair of massive, dark ovals which stared back at me. A black suited being looked like a bizarre parody of a man, like someone who'd never seen a human being had tried to design one from a vague description. The creature saw me stare at him and looked back through the thin glass with those god-awful eyes. And he opened his mouth and spoke, in a deep, croaky voice, although I was surprised to discover he spoke almost more perfect English. Good morning, sir. I am representative of the Church of God's Many Kingdoms. May I come inside and speak with you about the pathway to peace and harmony? <sighs> I 
I was left dumbstruck. Hang on, actually. Okay. I was left dumbstruck. A stomp spread of words this creature had just uttered. What was this being? What did it want from us? I was sure its words were a ruse. A means of getting entry to my sister's home for whatever malicious intent it really held. You need to get off the porch, I said through clenched teeth. The creature's grin widened as he persisted. Please, sir, I can appreciate this is a confusing situation, but if you let me inside, I can explain everything. I froze for a moment and did briefly consider the creature's offer. Could the odd being really provide the answers I want so badly? I honestly don't know what would have happened had my sister not intervened. Get the hell off my porch, you son of a bi- I can't add a finish that word. She screamed angrily. The creature didn't look a happy. His grin disappeared and his eyes narrowed. I swear I could hear her said as his voice when he next spoke. As you wish, ma'am. He replied before moving on, slinking back to the sidewalk in a most unnatural manner. Lily and I watched without saying a word as a strange, black-suited being head to the next house along, but he wasn't the only one. We saw a four or near identical and suited humanoids, two on each side of the street. Moving from house to house and knock on doors as they repeated the same phrase over and over in an attempt to gain entry. Doors remained firmly locked as Lily's neighbor sent them on their way. But then one of the number reached Dan's house. The hermit was still grieving after the death of his beloved pet, and I guess he was on edge after the previous day's attack. And when the black-suited being attempted to gain entrance to Dan's house, the homeowner reacted aggressively. Excuse me, e sir. May I speak with you about the path to peace and harmony? Get the hell off my property, you freak! Please, sir, the, aunt, the creature answered calmly. I mean you no harm. This is your final warning! Dan replied menacingly. Sir, the creature didn't get the opportunity to finish his sentence, as a second later, there was a gunshot from the other side of the door, and the black suit creature was cut down by buckshot. His vibe being flung backwards as his uh, uh, spilled all over the sidewalk. <sighs> the creature didn't move, and so I guessed he'd been killed instantly. But then, the strangest thing happened. We watched as the other black suited beings abandoned their door to door mission and instead walked calmly over to their fallen brother. One might have expected the four to seek bloody vengeance upon Dan for killing their comrade, but instead, they carefully lifted their brother's dead body and slowly carried him down the street in a solemn and silent procession. Lily and I watched in a saw as the party left our street and disappeared around the corner. And then Eve came to my side, shaking my treasure leg and asking, Uncle Dante, why did they hurt that man? I looked into her sweet and innocent eyes and realized I didn't have an answer. I guess one of the other neighbors must have reported the shooting because the cops arrived a few minutes later. Three police officers arrived in two patrol cars. Sheriff Omar, my friend Carl, and a female deputy named Tanya. These three the officers represented the entirety of Purgatory's tiny police force and they never faced a situation like this in all their combined years of service.
I was shocked to see the cops drawing their uh, uh, pistols as if, as if his sheriff shouted out to the assailant. Dan, you need to put the gun down and come out with your hands up. To hell I will, came Dan's fine response. This is my house and I'm not leaving. Come on, Dan, the sheriff shouted. Don't make it worse for yourself. There was a brief pause before the door slowly opened and Dan emerged. I felt relief for a moment as I thought the siege could be resolved peacefully. But then I saw he was still holding a shotgun and there was a madness in his bloodshot eyes. What the hell do you people want from me? He cried maniacally. Drop the gun, the sheriff screamed. I don't know which one of the cops fired first, but a bloodshot rang out and a single round struck Dan in, the, in his shoulder. He didn't fall, and instead cocked his shotgun, leading to a barrage of bullets the officer shot him at least a dozen times. I looked on in horror as Dan's lifeless body fell to the tarmac, his blood mixing with that of the creature he'd slain other minutes before. A tragic incident marks like the end of the second wave of the invasion, introducing the faction we'd later call the Prophets. These pale-skinned, black-suited beings proved to be one of the most passive, to be the most passive of all the invaders, merely knocking people's doors and delivering to deliver, and attempting to deliver their mysterious message. Some reacted violently to their appearance, but most simply ignored the prophets once they learned they didn't pose a threat. But in time, some of the towns folk began listening to these strange beings, and what they had to say was astonishing. But I'll get to that later. A meeting was called that evening at our town on hall. People were becoming increasingly unsettled and were demanding answers. I attended the meeting while Lily stayed home to look after Eve. The hall was packed, and I guess there must have been over 200 people present. I had elected to leave my rifle at home, but I saw the others were armed, which only adds to the tension. It felt like a tinderbox inside of that hall, like a single misspoken word could push the attendees over the edge. I remained silent during the heated discussion, listening to the paranoid theories exposed by espoused by the town's citizens. That is a new word. The government are running an experiment, claimed one woman. They're using us as guinea pigs, sending these monsters into our town to see how we'll react. That's garbage, said an early man shot back. This is judgment day, pure and simple. The gates of hell have opened and this is only the beginning. It seemed clear that no one really knew what was going on. All we had was the panic theories of the Lujon and frightened people. Hmm. Our town's mayor was Mar Aria Rodriguez, a popular and respected public servant who had made a good peacetime leader. But I suppose she'd never anticipated facing a situation as such as this. The mayor walked up onto the podium, looking haggard and nervous. She was flanked by Sheriff Arif Omar and his deputies, and three cops quickly keeping a close eye upon the armed citizens in the audience. The mayor began to speak slowly into the microphone, her voice steady but still portraying her ear. Good people of Purgatory, thank you for coming this evening. Let's not sugarcoat things. We are facing an unprecedented and dangerous situation. Our community has suffered tragic deaths. Our emergency services are stretched to near breaking point. 
We don't know what's coming next or how long this crisis will last. But we must come together as a community during these dark times. What the hell is this? The heckler shouted. We came here for answers, not false platitudes. What is happening to our town? We don't have all the answers just yet, the mayor replied, less confidently. But we're working hard to get this information. Why has the military blocked the roads? Another man shouted. Why won't they let us evacuate? We haven't been able to speak with the military yet, but we're trying. The mayor wasn't even allowed to finish her sentence before an angry voice interrupted her. This is bullshit! They're not telling us the truth! Now at this point, the meeting descended into near anarchy as a hundred voices cried out all at once and the, layer, and the mayor lost control. I could only watch as the crowd grew more increasingly hostile. The three... The cops noticed this too. The three officers stepped forward, placing their hands on their gun holsters. The ugly situation might have might well have been, of descended into violence had not been for a timely interruption. <clears throat> My head turned as the hall door swung open and a loud voice shouted, Come quick! Those son of bitches are looting the supermarket! Old arguments were soon forgotten as Mop held out the door and onto the street. Sheriff, Sheriff Omar tried to take back control of the situation, ordering the armed citizens to return to their homes and let the police deal with it. But he had no chance. Soon men and women were, were jumping into their cars and made a short drive over to the town's only supermarket, located close to the river. I hopped into my SUV and followed them. I was concerned about the angry mob and naively thought I could act as a calming influence. We arrived to a scene of chaos, finding the front the front gate. Uh, the front glass of the market smashed open as the gang blues powered up everything they could carry in shopping trolleys. There were around a dozen looters in total and looked like they were led by a guy called Kevin. A small time thug who'd spent time in state penitentiary for drug offenses. Sheriff Omar, Carl, and Tanya were the first on the scene, drawing their weapons and ordering Kevin and his people to surrender. But several of the leaders were also armed, as were members of the angry mob who'd followed from the town hall. I waited for the inevitable sound of gunfire, but suddenly a new group entered this affray. Why are they describing sounds as a dins? That doesn't really make sense to me. The attackers came in a wave, moving rapidly across the parking lot before descending upon the shattered front of the market. These new creatures looked like a cross between human beings and lizards. Their hides covered in thick green scales and their yellow bug-like eyes appearing like those of a reptile. They were slim and sleek, scurrying rapidly along the tarmac. Some on two legs, others on all fours, no one had time to react before they a pounce. The lizard er er men didn't go for the people, not first anyway. Instead, they fought with the looters for possession of the stolen wa food and water, ripping packages and bottles from the hands of bemused and frightened criminals. Some handed over the stolen goods, but others fought back, struggling frankly with the otherworldly creatures and turning the parking lot into a battlefield. Kevin was particularly reluctant to give away a coveted bottle of a single malt whiskey which he had stolen. He wrestled with a lizard man for possession of the bottle, but ultimately it fell from his hands, shattering on the tarmac. Kevin was furious, pulling a revolver from his waistband and shooting the lizard man in the head. 
The creature's brain slid off over the concrete and, and its body fell. Kevin's victory was short lived, however, as within in seconds the rest of the green scaled creatures turned on him, attacking with claws and teeth in a mad frenzy. Kevin screamed in agony as the beast literally tore him to shreds. That is a bit of a graphic description. A moment later, and the sheriff gave the order to open fires. His deputies shot the lizardmen, as it had several of the armed civilians. Numerous creatures fell under a barrage of bullets, as had several of the human leaders who got caught in the crossfire. It was a horrifying massacre, but ended quickly as the surviving lizardmen fled as quickly as they arrived. The remaining rulers surrendered to the police. I was sickened by the smell of cordite and the sight of blood and viscera. Sadly, it wasn't over yet. Suddenly, my attention was drawn to the far to the north where the I one bridge out of town was located. To my horror, I saw a convoy of civilian in and vehicles speeding across the bridge in a desperate attempt to break through the military blockade. For a brief moment, it looked like they might succeed, but then the unthinkable happened. I heard heavy machine gun fire and saw bright tracer rounds lighting up the darkness. The military on the far side of the bridge had opened fire, pumping rounds of high-velocity bullets into the, into the defenseless civilian cars trying to cross. The first vehicle burst into flames and exploded, while the next two were riddled with bullets as the driver's petrus were cut to shreds. The drivers were down the line, desperately reversed in an attempt to escape the carnage. In the panic which followed, one vehicle inadvertently reversed off the bridge and plunged into the cold waters below. Other cars tried to turn and around, but didn't get as far as one of their occupants fell to military bullets. The shock and disgust of the people around me was palpable. Several screamed, and at least one vomited behind me. I didn't know how to react to the massacre, merely shaking my head in, in disbelief and muttering, Sweet Jesus. The lit is a man that can outsee the third wave of the unworldly invasion. We called them the thieves. Their assault upon the supermarket had been less than successful. But dozens of these creatures had invaded our town and its, and its running exclusion zone. And for a time, they attacked and looted homes and shops with near impunity. They mainly went after food, which was already in short supply. But some also stole valuables, such as gold and jewelry. Generally speaking, these creatures didn't, didn't deliberately attack people, but they did react violently whenever someone stood in their way. And this resulted in, in many injuries and several deaths. Before long, armed civilians began to take the law into their own hands by hunting down and shooting lizardmen and human looters alike. For a while, it seemed like purgatory it would descend into bloody anarchy. But thankfully, the mayor and sheriff were able to restore some degree of control by appointing the vigil entities as volunteer deputies and placing them under the nominal control of the sheriff's department. But our real problem wasn't the bizarre invaders, it was the military. I would have never believed that our own army would shoot us down like dogs. But the incident on the bridge had shown they would use lethal force to keep us from escaping the town.
We were trapped, a band by our government and unable to communicate with the outside world. And what's more, we had no idea what would hit us next, and that was truly terrifying. But nevertheless, life went on as much as possible. The next 48 hours were relatively quiet. Some beasts and thieves continued to appear, but their numbers were much reduced, and the prophets who were deemed harmless and so were largely ignored. The vigilante patrols maintained law and order, and the mayor's office rationed at our remaining food stocks. Thankfully, although our communications were down, our electricity and water supplies were still on, although no one could say how long this would last. <sighs> After two days of relative peace and quiet, I guess you could say we became complacent, because we didn't see the next attack coming. It was the early hours of Thursday morning. I'd been out on a vigilante patrol that evening and was physically exhausted, and yet I could not sleep, instead laying on the hard mattress in my sister's guest room and staring at the ceiling. <clears throat> At about 3 a.m., I heard a banging noise coming from my niece's bedroom, followed by a soft, whimpering sound. Instinctively, I jumped up, suddenly alert. We'd only just persuaded Eve to sleep in her own bed again, as she'd been suffering from night terrors. I suspected she'd had another nightmare, but decided to go investigate, just in case. I felt a dark foreboding as I put my hand on the door handle, slowly opening it to reveal a horrific scene. My niece was being manhandled by a monstrous creature with leathery skin, small but squat, its eyes shining like those of a cat. It hissed when it saw me, spitting venom in my direction as it tightened its grip upon Eve. The bedroom window was wide open, and I guess this is how the foul old monster had gained entry. Nat had its light right leg on the windowsill as it sought to make good at its escape. I ignored the beast, however, focusing my attention upon my young niece, whose eyes were wide with an absolute terror. Uncle Dante! She cried as tears rolled down her cheeks. I darted forward to reach her, but the creature acted quickly, tossing a metallic device in my direction. I saw what looked like a hand grenade drop on the floor in front of me, and I instinctively retreated, the blast throwing me backwards as the light temporarily blinded me. I was vaguely aware of Lily swimming down the corridor, even though the ring in my ears in through the ring in my ears, I could hear my niece's screams as she was dragged off into the night. Luckily for me, the bomb was designed to disorient disorientate, red, and kill or maim, so I suffered no serious injuries. This was of little consolation to me at the time, however. My sister was in near hysterics as she chased the monster who kidnapped her daughter, only to lose him in the darkness. What a creature. There were sightings of the creature all over town that night, no one had gotten a good look at the monster. <coughs> but it or he was described as small and squat, no more than five feet tall, with short, earth and stubby legs. And yet the creature was surprisingly quick and stealthy, able to sneak into people's homes undetected and navigate the darkness to escape. On that night. He successfully snatched three children, including Eve. All were under the age of ten. The kidnapper, as it became known to us, the townsfolk. 
I attempted to grab several more children, but their parents had been more alert than I'd been. We quickly mobilized the vigilante patrols and began a painstaking search of the town and surrounding countryside, but to no avail. We discovered peculiar tracks past the town's boundary it shortly after dusk and theorized that the kidnapper had made good at his escape upon a hooved animal, carrying our children in tow. We followed the tracks for some time, only to lose the trail as it led into the mountains. The kidnapper alone represented the fourth wave of this hellish invasion, which had befallen our sleepy little town. This single, odd-looking monster had wreaked havoc on, upon our community, inflicting a huge psychological blow that nearly pushed us over the edge. It's difficult for me to describe what it's like to lose a child under your care. The emotional devastation, the helplessness, and the fear of what they're suffering alone. I experienced all these emotions. What I felt uh, must only have been must have only been a fraction of my sister was going through. To her great credit, Lady Dent's descent into hysterics. She was too strong for that. She led the searchers of the mountains as we combed every square foot of territory and sought to find clues. We found evidence of each of the four waves up to that point, establishing without doubt that the, that the invasion originated from the mountains. But yet there were, there are many unexplored caves and bad mine shafts up there, and so we were unable to find the source of the invasion or point of entry. Lily and I were returning from a fruitless, all-night search, arriving back in town frustrated and emotional on Friday morning. As we walked down the, the main street under the rising sun, we noticed a ruckus occurring outside of the town hall. Running closer, I saw a, town, a group of our fellow Old townspeople, all screaming in fear and raving around various weapons as they formed a circle. Sheriff Omar was pushing his way into the center of the circle, shouting for people to back off, but with little success. Lily and I shoved the path through and saw the sorry son of a bitch who'd drawn the crowd's anger. It was a soldier in a ripped uniform, disarmed and being accosted by the mob. I reckon they meant to lynch him in retaliation for the shooting on the bridge. I looked to the, so to the soldier's dog tag and noticed his name was Char Sergeant Hamilton. And then I saw his face and recognized him instantly. Hey, wait, stop! I shouted long enough to be he heard over the banging mob. That's Chuck! I went to high school with him! He's one of us! He's one of the soldiers or for the barricade, Lily said suspiciously. The same ones that shot our people. I wasn't involved in that, Chuck replied defensively. As soon as I found out what those bastards were doing, I deserted my unit. I grew up in this town and there's no way I'd, I, I would kill my own people. You say that, but how do we know you're telling the truth, Lily asked. For all we know, you're a spy sent to infiltrate us. There were nods of agreement from many in the crowd, and I felt the need to intervene. I told you, I went to school with Chuck. He's one of the good guys. Mm -hmm. 
The anger subsided as Chuck was escorted inside of the town hall, and the mayor was summoned so she could hear his story. Ten minutes later, and most of the town's folk were assembled, all watching and listening intently as our mayor addressed her questions towards the deserter. What is happening? Why is the government doing this to us? She asked sternly. Chuck made her eye as he answered. They don't tell us grunts much, but I've picked up some information over the last few days of the e operation. He paused briefly before whispering his next words. Have you ever heard of the multiverse? The mayor looked puzzled, but offered an answer nonetheless. I believe it's a theory that many alternate universes exist in parallel to our own. Chuck nodded his head in the affirmative. Yeah, that's what I understand, but it's not theory. The multiverse is a real deal, and our government knows about it. Wait, the mayor interrupted. Are you saying these... these things, these monsters, are from a parallel universe? You got a better explanation, Chuck shot back. But how'd they get here? The mayor asked frantically. I'm no scientist, Chuck replied, but the way I understand it, there are walls separating the, the dimensions, and sometimes these walls break down, and so you get temporary rifts in time and space. The government has the technology to, to detect these rifts and seeks to contain them, but they keep this a secret from the public to avoid mass panic. I held my tongue for long enough. I couldn't resist for asking a follow-up question. So if the government contains NC's rifts, what the hell happened here? I asked. Chuck smiled grimly before er er answering me. They screwed up. That's what happened. The brass sent up a survey team with an armed security detail to secure the site. But something had already come through the rift, and the team was overwhelmed. Command called in the cavalry, but by then it was too late. The hostile entities had already entered the town, so they cut their losses and sealed off the roads. You mean they abandoned us to die? I shot back angrily. Yeah, Chuck replied, making eye contact as a guilt entered his voice. They are prepared to sacrifice the whole town to cover their mess. I'm afraid there's no way out. That's not necessarily true, said a new voice. We all turned to see Eddie, an elderly, formerly coal mi form armor coal miner, who had been barricaded in his house since the start of the crisis, but was recently rescued by a vigilante patrol. There's an old tunnel that leads through the mountains that we used back in the day. It's been in the band for decades, but it should still will be passable. Seriously? There's a way out for us? I exclaimed in surprise, as a glimmer of hope entered my eerie heart. It doesn't matter, Lily said sternly. I'm not leaving without my daughter, nor will any of the other parents. There were murmurs of agreement from the, from some of the townsfolk, although others surely felt different. We were facing a terrible dilemma with no easy answer. Ultimately, I'm not sure what would have happened had events not intervened once again. We heard the distant sound of gunshots, followed by screaming, and I think everyone present realized that a further attack had begun. We piled out, out onto the street while Sheriff... Omar attempted to radio his deputies, although he was unable to reach them. The sound of, of battle 
grew ever closer, with the cries of terror and gunshots interspersed with the predatory roars of a yet unseen enemy. We knew they were headed in our direction, so we hastily set up a defensive barricade, using our vehicles and set ourselves up behind them. Both Lily and I, I were still armed following our patrol, so we read our weapons and prepared for battle. My instinct was to send my sister out of harm's way, but I knew she wouldn't listen. We ha have already gone past the hour-long mark. A tense moment followed as we surveyed the road and waited, but the assault came in the manner we didn't come in the manner we'd expected. I caught a glimpse of the enemy out of the corner of my eyes. Aye, dark shapes scurrying in quickly across the flat top roofs to bypass our barricade. I cried a warning, but it was already too late. The first piece is leapt from the rooftop and instantly went for the sheriff. It was almost as if it knew who to take out first. The sheriff saw his attacker late, screaming as he swung around and tried to fire, but the monster was too fast. It roared before slashing out with its mighty claws, slicing the, the sheriff's throat wide open and almost chopping his head clean off. His blood spilled and the sheriff's body eliptly fell. I swung around and raised my rifle, getting a good look at the creature for the first time. If this if this monster wasn't a real life werewolf, then it was something very close to one. Half man and half canine, the beast stood at over six feet tall, its claws and dark fur now bloodied, and its hungry eyes searching for it out its next target. The werewolf saw me and roared through his Fang field maw before it charged towards me at immense speed, covering the ground in no time. I wasn't able to aim, and so fired from the hip in a blind panic. Recklessly, my bullet followed its mark, found its mark, hitting the beast in the shoulder and forcing it to yup and, and retreat on all fours. But the attack was far from over. In an instant, another dozen werewolves left off the top of buildings from both sides of the street, setting upon on the human defenders with a murderous zeal. A bloodbath ensued as the attackers sliced and diced my neighbors in quick succession, slaughtering them with claws and fangs before moving on to the next victims. The armed vigilante screamed in terror and fired wildly, but to little effect, as the sheer speed of the enemy's assault overwhelmed our people. It was Chuck who took charge of the chaotic situation, grabbing hold of, the discard of a discarded rifle and laying down a suppressing fire as he barked out orders. We can't hold them back! Get back to the uh, hall! Protect the kids and the older ones and the old folks! We didn't need to be told twice. I fired another shot at an attack and attacked before grabbing my sister as we fled back towards the town hall. Many had already fallen, but uh, those who were still on their feet retreated. Chuck coming last as he took out another werewolf with a well-placed round. We reached the relative safety of the town hall, unprepared to shut the heavy doors and barricade ourselves inside. But Lily and I had stayed at the last moment when we saw a figure darting from her hiding place underneath a parked car. It was our mayor, Maria Rodriguez. She'd been wounded, slide across her thigh and living. But the woman was still alive. Please don't leave me, she screamed, a pure terror now evident in her voice. Hurry! Lily shouted back as we held the door open. I love how I give these people all the same voice. It's almost like I'm one person trying to be like multiple people when there are way too many characters. 
Maria ran, but she wasn't fast enough as a werewolf leapt upon her, tearing at the helpless woman with his sharp claws. We heard her screams and witnessed a bloodbath. I couldn't do anything to help. And Chuck slammed the door shut and locked it behind him. We successfully defended the town for the next 24 hours, but in truth, we were lucky to survive. The werewolves were intelligent and coordinated. They didn't launch a full-scale attack during the daylight hours, instead testing our defenses and fraying our nerves. They received reinforcements at dusk, more monsters, fresh from committing bloody massacres in other parts of the town. After dark, they unleashed a near a devastating assault, attacking the town hall from all sides as they tried everything to force their way inside. We fought back fiercely, knowing that our survival depended upon it. Chuck made good use of his military experience to coordinate the defense, and I don't think we would have survived without him. Nevertheless, by then, we were almost out of ammunition and faced with the terrifying prospect of having to fight the monsters hand to hand. But thankfully, their attack broke down as many of their number lay dead on the street, and the survivors retreated before the sun rose. After the battle, we took stock, tending as best as we could to the wounded and trying to comfort each frightened children. We had survived the night, but were under no illusion as to the seriousness of our situation. The mayor and sheriff were both dead, as were many of our town's people. The royals were gone for now, but they could come back at any time. They were the fifth wave, who we called the killers, because that's what they did. The wolfen slaughtered everyone that they came into contact with, showing no mercy for their victims. Those who made it into the town hall were lucky, but few survived the onslaught upon the rest of Purgatory. We had been like lambs to slaughter, literally in this case. Nevertheless, the fifth wave of attacks had clarified the situation for those who survived. We knew we had to get out of town, otherwise we were all going to die. We need to make a decision, Chuck began as he spoke to the town hall occupants. The military man had saved us all during the desperate battle with the werewolves and had assumed a leadership role, now that the mayor and sheriff were both dead. He turned to Eddie, the long-retired coal miner who offered us a chance of escape. You say you know a tunnel through the mountains? Can you lead our people to do it? I reckon so! I told you, I'm not leaving without my daughter! Lily interjected angrily. I know you're not. Chuck replied firmly. That's why I'm going to lead a mission to the other side. We're going to find the kids and bring them home. My sister's eyes lit up for the first time in days as she responded, Good, and I'm going in with you. Chuck looked shocked, turning to me to seek support, but I simply shrugged my shoulders, knowing there was no way of talking my sister out of it. Lily was going to the other side in search of Eve, and I was coming with her. We rested for a day at Chuck's insistence before our group split in two. Eddie led the women, children, and wounded elderly up the mountain path to the tunnel, which military had missed. Meanwhile, Chuck, Lily, and I formed a scouting party along with the, the fathers of the, the other two kidnapped children. The men's names were Douglas and Juan. We stocked up on food, water, first aid, its flies, and ammunition, not knowing what we'd, uh, what we'd find on the far side of the cross-dimensional rift. Chuck had stolen a map showing the rift's location before he deserted. And so, he set our course. 
We were forced to cross through the ruins of Purgatory on our way to the site, and we, next, and we witnessed a full extent of the killer's savage assault. I lost count of how many dead bodies we found, most of them mutilated, and in some cases beyond recognition. The town's medical center, which had already been overburdened with casualties, had some of it burned to the ground during the onslaught. The charred remains of the victims left amongst the smoking ashes. We found the two deputies, my old friend, Carl and Tanya. They died fighting side by side, shooting down three werewolves before they were eventually overwhelmed and slaughtered. There were worse sights too, ones that I don't wish to recount or even recall. Entire families have been wiped out, dying in each other's arms. These were my neighbors and friends, and it hurt me deeply to lose them. We expected to be ambushed at any moment, but but thankfully we didn't encounter any more of those savage it wolfmen. We did see several of the lizardmen as they looted the dead bodies for valuables, while bat like scavengers feasted upon the flesh of the many corpses. Furious at witnessing this this desecration, I fired upon the thieves and upon several of the thieves and beasts until Chuck ordered me to stop. He didn't want me to waste ammunition, which we would likely need. I mean, the first beasts were obviously but dinosaurs. We found a few survivors, but curiously, those we saw did not want our help. Instead, they turned to the prophets. The odd black suited humanoids we'd counter on day two of the invasion. We were astonished to see groups of blades survivors sitting close legged across from pale faced prophets, listening and attending to every word that they being spoke. I was baffled to witness this strange development, but there was no time to investigate, and so we moved on. Chuck led us through a cave entrance close to the foot of the mountains, which we'd miss during our searches. We used flashlights to guide us through the darkness and avoid the debris of equipment and weaponry which had evidently been banned by the military survey team during their hasty retreat. The transdimensional rift was located at the rear of the cave, and boy, it was something to see. From our side, it looked like a vertical wall of tra perfectly still, transparent liquid, and on the other side was a very it was a mirror image of the cave we stood in, except it was located in an entirely different dimension. The five of us simply stood there in the darkness for a long time. Awestruck by the inexplicable portal all in front of us and uncertain of what to do next. Do we just walk through? I asked nervously. Is it safe? Damn if I know, Chuck replied honestly. It's my first time too, buddy. I was reluctant to take the next step, fearing that something awful would occur if I attempted to step through the breach. But my sister held no such fears, or if she did, she quickly conquered them. Taking a deep breath, Lily stepped forward, leaving us men in her wake. <clears throat> I watched in terrified awe as my sister stepped through the liquid membrane, clearing a path before she emerged on the other side, looking back and rushing for us to follow. I went through next, feeling bitterly cold and lightheaded as the membrane broke to allow me safe passage. And then I was through the rift. It was as simple as that, but we had no idea of what lay ahead in this strange new world. Once all five of us had passed through, our party regrouped and proceeded out of the cave, soon emerging into the open to observe the astonishing landscape of mist-covered forests which stretched for as far as they yet yeah, could see. <clears throat> There was something almost magical about the untouched wilderness that lay before us.
but also a darkness and foreboding danger. The scene reminded me of a fantasy world, and I imagine our party as brave adventurers embarking upon a noble but dangerous quest. My dreamlike vision soon faded, however, as I considered the grim practicalities of our missions. Two questions, I said, and while I was speaking in, in with Chuck. Firstly, are we sure we can return home safely? My military friend shrugged his shoulders before answering bluntly. I don't know. Debras says his rifts don't stay open indefinitely. It's not, exact it's not an exact science as I understand it. But if the portal does close over over here, well, I guess we'll become permanent residents. A chill ran through my body upon hearing those words. I think deep down, we all knew we might not make it back to our world, but this was the risk we had to take for our children. <sighs> okay, I responded with a lump in my throat. Second question. Where the hell do we go from here? Chuck paused for a moment, looking out onto the horizon before pointing. I think that would be a good start. I looked where he was pointing and saw that all what appeared to be a stone tower located on a hill a few miles to the north of us. It was the only man-made structure we could see amongst the dense forest. We had a quick vote, and we all agreed, and we were all and we were all in agreement that we sh would head for the mysterious fortification. And soon we entered the woods, preparing to face whatever dangers lay ahead. The forest vegetation was thick, and there was no path we could find, and so our progress was slow. It was an unnerving experience to walk underneath those dark trees, to reverse a woodland which seemed familiar in some respects, but was totally different from our home world. I don't know about the others, but I had an unpleasant feeling that we were being watched. Perhaps this was paranoia, but during our trek, we did see the occasional alien creature hiding in bushes or high up in branches. They scurried once they heard us approach, but I still held the distinct impression that we were invaders in their territory. Nevertheless, our trek through the woods was relatively uneventful until we reached a hillside not far from the mysterious structure which was, uh, which was our destination. The attack came like a bolt from the blue. I heard a deep growl, turning to see a flurry of movement as a beast leapt in the trees to our side. One turned to face the threat, but wasn't fast enough. The killer werewolf pounced upon our companion before he had a chance to fire a shot, fighting deep into his throat. Juan screamed in, ag in agony as his juggler was ripped open. In an instant, we all opened fire, cutting the werewolf to shreds with our bullets, but a moment later, and a second beast attacked through the bushes. In an instant, it cut Douglas down with its razor-sharp claws before charging it straight at me, tearing across the forest floor at an immense speed. I aimed and pulled the trigger, only to hear an empty click. My rifle had jammed on me. I cursed as the werewolf roared, its eyes lighting up with a murderous glee as it prepared to pounce on me. I closed my eyes and prepared for death, only to be brought back to reality by the loud crack of a gunshot. When I looked again, I saw the werewolf laying dead on the ground, and Chuck sang over it with a spoken gun in his hands. The attack was is over, but we'd lost two of our party. There was little we could do for our Juan and Douglas. We had no means of burying their bodies, and, and so simply held a moment's silence for moving on. It broke my heart that these two fathers would never see their children again. I knew we owed it to them to bring their sons home safely. The round stone tower on the hill must have been close to 100 feet tall. I had no idea of who built it or, or what purpose, but when I looked 
up to an open window, I swore I could see a shadowy figure waiting for us to approach. The tower was surrounded by a thick wall about 12 feet in height. We had no clue what to expect and feared the castle would be heavily defended. But as we carefully walked around the defenses, we were surprised to see a gate wide open and undefended, allowing us to simply walk inside. I was so astonished by what we found that I thought my eyes must be, must be deceiving me. Inside of the castle, sitting cross-legged under the shadow of the tower, were even the two young boys who'd been kidnapped, all looking healthy and happy. But what really threw me off was the strange beings who sat alongside the, the children, smiling contently as the kids laughed and played. They were prophets, three of them in total, sitting in a circle. They were no longer dressed in the black suits they'd worn on, on our world, instead they wore brown robes like those of a monk, but their skin was still a ghostly shade of pale. Their smiles were unsettling, but the three children appeared comfortable and unafraid in their presence. I stood there inside of the gate, unable to comprehend what I was witnessing, but my sister didn't stand on ceremony. Lily's eyes lit up with joy and sheer relief as she called out her daughter's name. Mommy! Eve cried as she ran across the courtyard, and Chuck and I watched as mother and daughter were reunited, hugging each other in a loving and heartwarming embrace. We stood back as one of the prophets approached us, smiling amicably as he spoke. Hello, my friends. We are pleased to see you. I don't understand, I replied. Who are you people, and what are you doing with our kids? The being you call the kidnapper is driven by the thrill of the hunt, but he soon loses interest in his victims after he's captured them. We found your children in a band here in the castle, and I've taken care of them over the past few days. I looked back to Eve and the smiling boys, and realized he must be telling the truth. As for my people, the prophet continued, our, mo our motivations are quite simple. We travel between the dimensions and spread our mission and spread our message of peace and reconciliation. These rifts result in a collision of wars, odds, and often this leads to violence and suffering, but it doesn't have to to be this way. So, you try to bring peace between violent beings from parallel universes, helping out slaughtering each other. Chuck summarized sarcastically. How's that working for you? That's why I saw something. Anyway. The being seemed to understand the cynical tone of my friend's question, but didn't rate ice to debate, instead answering quite calmly. Our task is a difficult one. This cannot be denied. Nevertheless, we will continue our mission. Even one mind change is a victory. Chuck was silenced, and I felt humbled by this being's noble cause. Well, we are certainly very grateful for what you have done for us, I said. It is our pleasure, the prophet replied, but be warned, the kidnapper has little interest in taking care for his captives, but that doesn't mean he'll take kindly to losing the children. It is likely that he will pursue you, therefore I recommend you leave this place immediately and head back to the rift. I nod my head, hearing the being's warnings, we and we left the, the tower soon after. We retrace our steps to the source and head back towards the, the mountains. Three armed adults and three young children in tow. It was not an easy journey.
we expected another attack at any moment, and so were constantly on alert. But we had to at least try to stay calm for the sake of the kids. Our situation only became worse as day turned to night and we were faced with the dark and sinister woods. Jumping at every shadow or cracking branch. Nevertheless, we nearly made it back to the cave before he finally caught up with us. We heard the heavy stomping of hooves from our rear as a large animal started towards us. Turning around, we shone our flashlights upon our pursuer, seeing the monster head on. It was a kidnapper, short and squawk, but squat, but with glowing eyes burning with hatred and a hideous mouth curled up in rage. We saw the beast he rode upon, but looked like a giant elk with huge and sharp horns. The monster mounted was coming at us with a frantic fury, and when he opened his lips, he spat just a single word in our language. MINE! <laughs> Chuck and I dropped to our knees and raised our rifles while I shouted back to Lily, Get the kids out of here! I heard the children screaming, but I'd focus upon our attacker. We fired multiple bullets, but I'd miss our mark. We're watching as the kidnapper reached into a sack and withdrew a metallic device, throwing it in our direction. A second later, and one of our bullets struck Uck the elk in its head, bringing the beast down and throwing its rider to the ground. But the grenade he had thrown had landed at our feet and was trying to explode. I was frozen in terror, waiting for the end to come. But in an act of extraordinary bravery, Chuck dived on top of the grenade, covering the bomb with his body. I screamed out loud, but it was too late. I heard the muffled sound of the explosion and witnessed my friend's body being blown apart. I stood over Chuck's corpse for a moment, awestruck by the ultimate sacrifice he'd made to save us. But the danger wasn't over yet. The kidnapper had survived his fall and was up on his feet, hissing in my direction as he reached for his sack of bombs. I raised my rifle to fire, but literally beat me to it, throwing round after round into the monster's body until the kidnapper fell and stopped moving. That's what you get for messing with my kid! Lily spat, the fury still in her eyes as I reached across and took hold of her smoking rifle. Come on, Lily. Let's go, I whispered. And so we did. Recklessly, we calmed the terrified children and made back to the cave without further incident. We carried the kids through the rift, arriving safely on the other side and returning to our home world. We barely crossed over before the portal faded and then disappeared entirely, replaced by the rocky back wall of the cave. I didn't understand what had just occurred. Either we'd been extremely lucky and had crossed back just in time, or the presence of the three missing children in the other dimension was an anomaly, and now they were home. The equilibrium had been restored, allowing the transmissional rift to close. In any event, we didn't dwell on the mystery, instead leaving the cursed cave and making our way down the mountainside. As planned, we rendezvoused with Eddie and the other survivors, finding the abandoned tunnel which led through the mountains past the military blockades. We have escaped the exclusion zone, and for the first time in seven days, I can communicate with the outside world and tell you our story. I don't know if we're safe, the government may still pursue us out of spite, but their big secret is now out of the bag. Our world is only one of many, and the walls between the dimensions are porous. There are many dangers out in the multiverse, but there's also hope, and in the end, we're going to have to learn to live together. Peace be with you, my friends. That was a long story. A good creepypasta, though. Really did satisfy my urge for more spooky stories today. 
Anyway, if you like this video, please leave a like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Sheesh. I have no idea what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then, goodbye.